All right. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. Today is Friday, April 19th, 2024. This training is called The Leader's Guide to Money and a Coming Financial Crisis, question mark, because we're going to have a discussion. Do you believe that we're in for another financial crisis? So what we like to start off with all of our trainings is with a two-minute guided meditation to really ground ourselves and be present and to be able to focus. So uh, let's do that right now. So I hope you guys enjoy. Hello there, and welcome to this two-minute meditation for grounding. Begin by sitting in a chair with your feet touching the floor. Relax your hands on your thighs with your palms facing upwards and close your eyes. Begin to breathe slowly in and out, noticing the feeling of how the air expands and contracts your belly and chest. Relax your body from head to toe and begin to imagine yourself in a beautiful, calming forest. Stay here and just admire the view, the trees, the sky, feeling the grass under your feet. Maybe it's autumn here and you feel the fallen leaves under your feet. As you stay here, relaxed and still, visualize how tiny roots begin to grow from the soles of your feet. These roots grow into the earth and make you feel grounded and secure. You now connect with Mother Nature's positive energy making you feel so protected and loved. See how these roots begin to grow deeper and deeper into the earth, becoming thicker. Observe how you feel now. And when you feel ready, move your toes and fingers. Open your eyes and continue your day filled with centeredness, confidence, and compassion. Namaste. All right, let's jump into the training. So what are we going to cover in today's training? So far, part one is today, right? We're going to split this training up into two different pieces because there was so much content to cover that this is the only way that we're, we're going to do it. So part one, we'll start off with a discussion. I really like to ask you as all members of Electus Society community, what are you, what are your thoughts on the state of the economy? And do you believe there's going to be a potential fi uh, financial crisis that's coming in the near future? Because again, a lot of people, if you watch the news, YouTube videos, it's doom, doom, doom. And so I just want to hear what your thoughts. And then after you share your thoughts, as I start to go into part two, I will share with you what my thoughts are on the state of the economy, not just from me as just Tim Duffy, but what I have learned from different economists that I really trust and who helped, uh, you know, create this training based on all my research that I've learned from them. So I'm going to share them uh, with you on who who those people are and what I've learned from them. I'm also going to give you the most important economic uh, concepts and definitions because you know what I have. I'm sorry to say I've taken macroeconomics uh, when I was in college. I took microeconomics in college. I took a, a environment on economics uh, class in college, and it's sad that I don't remember like 99% of the stuff that I learned from those classes, but. I did learn some things, but what I really got in terms of preparing this training is how could I distill the most important fundamental things if you've never taken an economics course that if you could just learn in the five to 10 minutes, what are the most important economic concepts 
as leaders, this is what I want to uh, uh, teach you all and what I've learned. Then we're going to jump into four reasons why leaders need to understand the economy and money and how that all works. And that's why we're going to do this in two different trainings. Uh, and then finally, we're going throughout the history of economic and financial crisis. And I have to confess, I was very naive going into this. I thought an economic crisis and a financial crisis were the same thing. It's only through my teachers that I've learned from different economists that they are two separate things, but they can also happen at the same time. And then lastly, we are going to talk about, or I'm going to show a, a video um, it's by Ray Dalio. And Ray Dalio is one of the uh, founder of one of the largest hedge funds in the country. And so it, it, it's a hedge fund that basically people borrow money, right? People give them this hedge fund their money and they invest it to get a return on investment. And they have over like, I think it's somewhere between 100 and $200 billion dollars worth of people's money that they're investing trying to grow so they've been very successful so if you and his net worth is like 19 billion dollars he knows a, a thing or two about the economy but because the video is a very simplified simplified version of the economy i like to give you my little commentary what i've learned to add addition to it in case it's a little too simple simple for all of you and so that's what we're going to cover in this first training. But in the second training, there's so much more. And we're going to do that training in about two weeks from now. We're going to talk about money specifically. What are the characteristics of money? What's the difference between money and fiat currency? Uh, learn how money is actually created. And so when, when we talk about uh, in this training today about how the Fed prints money, well, it's not actually true. They create credit. It's banks that really create a lot of the money. And we're going to show and talk about that in the second training. And then Bitcoin. Wow, Bitcoin's such a popular thing. It's the new money. You know, it's going to be the new reserve currency. Well, guess what? Based on a lot of the economists that I've heard from, there's pros and cons to each side. And so I'm not going to tell you uh, right or wrong. I'm just going to share with you my research. Then it's a very important for you to understand that there's so many different schools of economic theory. And I'm going to give you a highlight of all these different economic schools, but the most popular economic theory that's in the news and that's very popular right now is this modern monetary theory. But I'm going to give you some of the pros, some of the cons. And then after, we'll talk about the factors that are really going to affect inflation, deflation, and preparing for the future. So our, our economy is such a complex thing that I wanted to share with you all these different factors and why it's so difficult for people to predict where the economy is going. And if we were ever to have like a depression-like event, well, guess what? I'm going to share with you what the nuclear option is, what I've learned from economists so that we're not going to have to have any fear uh, on what we could do. And then lastly, I want to actually teach you all what these economists have been saying on how to invest, you know, because of both personally uh, in terms of you and your family, what, how would you invest in an inflationary environment, a deflationary environment? And again, we're going to go over those terms during this training. So I hope you uh, enjoy this training as well as enjoy the second half of this training in the next two weeks. So let's jump right in. What are your thoughts on the state of the economy? So feel free to just unmute yourself. I would love to hear. What do you think? Uh, it, uh, how's the economy doing? I might actually call on some people. Bismala, would you be so kind to share your key insights on what you think is the state of the economy? There is no right or wrong answer. It's just your opinions based on what you think and what you've observed. Feel free to unmute yourself if you're available. Bismala, are you there? All right, maybe you're not available at this time. Marty, how about you? Can you unmute yourself? Are you available? Yes, I am. Um... My connection is a little bit spotty at the moment, so I apologize if I drop out. Um, to be honest, on the state of the economy, I don't have many opinions about it. Um, I've read a couple of articles and I've seen a few things on the on the news, but I feel like we will never really know the actual state of the economy until it starts affecting people. And that's something that I have personal experience with, um, especially when it came to the recession many years ago. And yep. I didn't even know that people were getting laid off until I saw people getting laid off due to the recession. So I don't have a real opinion on the state of the economy. Um, I just have to say that 
the effects of it, we won't know unless it starts happening to us directly. Yeah. And what do you see in the news? Do you think people are saying that the economy is doing very well? Do you think, are you reading how the economy is doing very badly? What are your thoughts or what have you read or seen in the headlines? So far, I've seen many people saying that we are heading straight towards the depression. Mm, um, okay. And people, I can tell that people are very nervous about that, especially when it comes to the jobs and yeah. Um, yeah. grocery prices and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um so that's just something that I've seen pretty so far, but I've also heard people say that um, there's still a chance that we could recover when it came when it comes to a possible depression and preventing it. I haven't heard of any actual solutions, but there has <laughs> been a bit of chatter when it comes to that. Well, then I'm so glad that you're part of this training because we're going to talk about that. And guess what? Yes, the government is going to do everything can they can to help prevent. A depression from happening. And they've learned from the last depression that we had in 1929 to 1930s and, you know, and beyond. And we also learned from the 2008 global financial crisis. There's things we learned from that. It was both a financial crisis and an economic crisis. We had a recession and we recovered. So again, one of, that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about here is why do these things happen? And we're going to answer that. And number two, guess what? There are tools the government can do to prevent it, but I want all of you prepared for everything that could happen, you know? And so I'm going to share with you uh, very shortly what my thoughts are on the state of the economy, but let's just get one other Final comment. Thanks so much, Marty, for sharing your feedback. Uh, Bismala wrote in the chat that he was on the train, so he couldn't share. So that's that's no problem. Thanks, Bismala. I appreciate that. And then uh, is there anybody else that would like to share? All right. Going once, going twice. All right. Let's keep going. Okay. Now, uh, do you think that there's going to be an economic or financial crisis in the future? Well, <laughs> I'm going to answer that. The answer is yes, <laughs> there is. Why? Because it happens all the time throughout history and it repeats and repeats. And if we don't learn from history, it's going to happen again. And what I'm going to actually share with you in this training, do you know that we had a financial crisis that didn't really get that much news? It got a little bit of headlines and it happened in 2023. Uh, and so we'll talk about that. So let's jump into understanding the basics of the economy. Now, I'm going to give a big disclaimer. This is one of the hardest trainings that I have ever had to put together. Why? It's because I'm not an economist. I am a leadership coach and trainer. I'm all about thoughts and feelings and, and, and to talk about economics and numbers. It's just my brain struggles to learn this, maybe the, and, uh, compared to other people that pick it up so easy. But I, I, I push through it. I almost had some, uh, what's that 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 term when you feel that you're not confident uh, it, to be able to do this training? I'm like, oh, uh, we're imposter syndrome. Like, Tim, should you even be doing a training on this? Who are you to be able, you're not, you're not a money manager. You're not a financial person. You know, you're going to be talking about investments and stuff like that. It's like, wow. But you know what? I do think it's really important that leaders know how the economy works uh, you know, how money works, because guess what? You're going to vote for people who are going to affect these policies or who knows some of you who are watching this training right now, you're going to be in positions of leadership that you're going to be able to make those changes. So I think you, you need to understand. And based on what Marty was uh, sharing about when, when she remembered the recession that we had, when people get let off, like that's a serious thing. You know, people lose their livelihood. People lose uh, hope. So what you can do and, and what you vote, the policies that our leaders implement in our government can really affect people's lives. So it's, that's why it's so important for us to know about this. And just again, here's my big disclaimer. I'm just going to share my research. All right. I'm not claiming this is the, the truth. Who knows? I can look back at this training years from now and say, hey, you know, some of that was not accurate. Well, guess what? I'm just sharing with you what I've researched, and I always recommend that you do your own research as well, okay? So how did I gather research for this training? Well, there are three important people that I want to share with you. 
And the first one is Steve Keen. Okay, he's known as a rebel economist. I found him very, very fascinating. He's from Australia. And the reason why I really like him so much is because he is super, super smart. And he's been able to use mathematical models based on like the research of Minsky and other economists and stuff like that to say, why does our economy have booms and busts, okay? Why does it go through this, the, these cycles? And he says it's a natural part of capitalism. Uh, and he basically engineered mathematical models that, that could actually predict when we're going to have a recession when they, and when we're going to increase our economic growth. And so he's very hard to listen to just because he is very, very smart and he's an economist and he uses a lot of big words and stuff like that. I got two of his books. One was called Debunking Economics. And he basically says a lot of our leaders who are in government, who are at the Fed, who are, you know, trying to control the economy and says, that, hey, we can prevent us from ever having a recession again. Well, guess what? The smartest people in the room couldn't predict the 2008 big financial crisis, but yet some people did. And Stephen King uh, was one of them. And so he's like, we need better models. And everything that we're being taught in economics is not accurate. It's missing something. If you have a model and you say, OK, I predict this, this is going to happen because of my models. If that doesn't happen, then guess what? You have to recognize your models are wrong. You have to re-examine your models. And so he wrote this other book, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Because this was meant for the almost like the layperson so that um, that uh, people can learn on how we can avoid it again. Ray Dalio, like I said, is the founder of the of Bridgewater Capital, a bit, excuse me, Bridgewater Associates. He wrote these two books. I have not read them, but I'm going to show a video of his that kind of uh, does a little bit of overview of what he's covered in the books. And then lastly is James Rickards. Okay. Now, James Rickards is a conservative. Now, Stephen King uh, he's very he's liberal, right? He thinks Trump is, uh, you know, uh, he hates Trump, although, you know, James Rickards would say, you know what, he might be pro Trump or, or in the in the thing that I like about James Rickards or James Rickards is that even though he may be conservative, he can actually uh, because he's a lawyer and he's trained, he can actually look at both sides of the issues. So he can actually be very critical of Trump. And I, I like that when I like to be able to see people who are not just so blinded by their ideology, but can actually, you know, say, hey, you either achieve the results or you don't, you know, and and, and he has that. He, uh, he, I've learned so much from him. I feel like he's like my economics teacher that I wish that I had. So I, I don't necessarily have to agree with everything that he says, but I pay attention. And why do I really like him is because he's such a good educator. He can take complex things and break them down to simple things that I'm like, oh, my goodness, why didn't my economics teacher explain it to me like this? And so he wrote two books called Sold Out on how the are um, all about um, in the post the pandemic, how prices were going up so high because guess what uh, uh, we're stopped uh, getting supplies uh, uh, we reduced the supplies from china and so right now we're going through a big shift where we're we want to become less dependent on china and these other countries and diversify and bring stuff more onshore for our manufacturing because we realized even though we could do it cheaper in china well guess what if anything happens again like a future pandemic we won't be able to have chips for our cars, uh, for our computers, for, you know, our supplies, our drugs. So, again, uh, you know, your your trade, your your inventory, all your supply chain is the economy. And then the uh, he wrote another book called The Great Depression, The New Great Depression, all about the pandemic, which I learned a lot from as well. So what are we going to talk about? OK, so let's talk about some basic economic definitions. I'm not going to overwhelm you with a lot of them. There's just like five or ten of them that I want you to know about. Number one, I need you to understand what the CPI is, the Consumer Price Index. OK, and the Consumer Price Index relates to these topics of inflation, disinflation, deflation, or another word for deflation is called recession or depression. So again, they use these terms. That's why it's so hard to really understand, but I'm going to do it in a very simple way that you guys all get it. GDP, our gross domestic product, our unemployment rate, which is very much in the news, but what they don't really talk about is labor participation rate. We'll talk about U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh, you know, when people, when you hear the news about the world reserve currency, U.S. is the reserve currency, guess what that really means? People, countries, 
buy U.S. Treasury bonds because they trust the U.S. government that 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 whenever they're going to park their money, they're going to get interest back. And it's a way of, of, of feeling safe for storing their money. And we're going to also talk about two other concepts that I think that was so fascinating that I feel like you all had to learn is all about the inverse relationships between interest rates and yields and price. Something that I heard about and I read about in economics class, but I didn't get it. But I'm going to do a job that I wish my economics teacher did and explain to you what that means and the difference between a nominal interest rate and a real interest rate. OK, and then the key players that you need to know on the economy are, are, are several fold. It's the Fed. It's our central bank. The U.S. Treasury, you know, the ones that issue treasure bond, treasury bonds are government and Congress. Right. They're the ones that tax and spend. And you guess what? You're a consumer of goods and services, but guess what? You also pay taxes and you also invest your money. You could also buy U.S. Treasury bonds and other kind of stuff. So all these different pieces come together to create our complex economy. And there's much more. I didn't even talk about other governments, other municipalities, but I just wanted to keep it simple. So let's jump right in. Consumer price index. What does that mean? The consumer price index is the current cost of goods and services in the U.S., compared to the cost in the previous year, right? Or previous point in time. And once they compare that, they multiply by 100 and they do a percentage. Okay, eggs were, you know, $5 last year. Now they're $10. Whoa, that's an increase in 100% <laughs> inflation. You know, again, I'm using that as an extreme example because they compare from year to year, right? But guess what it does not include? It does not include income and social security, taxes, stocks, bonds, real estate, life insurance, because they say that these are not day-to-day -day consumption. So from the food you eat, to the rent, to the airplanes, to your medical care, to services, clothing, et cetera, et cetera, what is the consumer price index of all these costs of these goods now compared to last year? So guess what they are in 2023? The average home is almost half a million dollars. I, I think it was in 2022, it was almost like, 300 uh you know thousand dollars uh average rent for a tiny little apartment is one thousand seven hundred and thirteen dollars that's for a t one bedroom little apartment and again this could be very different if you're living in New York California if there's high demand low demand these prices could be even higher a little bit lower average food that people are spending almost 800 bucks a month right and that's not even including groceries that may include groceries and eating out and in your healthcare, oh my goodness, almost spending a thousand dollars a month. So people are feeling all the cost of goods go up, you know, and that's why you've been noticing the news. The CPI has been rising. So now that you know what CPI is, there's three things that you need to really know: inflation, disinflation, and deflation. So what is inflation? It's a general increase in prices. That means the value of your money is going down. So in 2008, look at we had inflation. So there was 4%, 5%, almost to 6% inflation compared to the year uh, before. But then as we progressed in the year, we had disinflation. That means we reduced the level of inflation. Now, many people make the mistake that whenever they see a reduction in inflation, they're like, okay, prices are going down. No, prices could still be high. They're just going down a little bit, but they're still higher than the year before. They're just not as high, right? Um, and then it's just the reduction in the rate of inflation. Okay, so it was going up and up. It's almost like you're going up a hill and it's like you're slowing down, but you're still going uphill. Um, deflation is when you have a decrease in prices, right? When prices are much lower than they were in the previous year. So this all happened within the span of uh, one year. Now, let me give you uh, the historical CPI. Look at from 1950 to the present, inflation, disinflation, ooh, we had deflation here, inflation, disinflation. So you can see that there's always inflation and disinflation. And so you might think like, oh, the prices are rising, the prices are declining, the prices are rising. And guess what? This can be very misleading. Why? Because you think like, okay, prices are just always gonna come back up and down, up and down. But that's not necessarily the case. This is the chart that I really wanted to share with you. Because remember how I said the CPI is the rate of change of, of, of prices of the previous year? This chart blew my mind. Just say, what were the prices on average in 1982? Okay, then let's just take the average prices and put them on this scale and let's look every single year. 
So guess what? Even though we'll have inflation, disinflation, inflation, disinflation, prices are getting higher and higher. Look at this. It's crazy. It's almost unbelievable, right? And it gets to the point where in 2020, inflation went really high. That could be for several factors. It could be for all the stuff that we did in terms of the government. It could be the, the COVID and the, and the prices and the chip shortages and all this other kind of stuff uh, could be a result of that inflation. But now you really understand when you hear from your grandparents, you're like, hey, I bought a car or Let's say I bought a candy bar. It was three dollars or two dollars, and they're like, "I remember when I was a kid, a candy bar only costed a nickel." You know, like now you get it. Inflation. This is happening, and it's going to continue to happen. All right. Next thing is gross domestic product. This is the total market value of all the finished goods and services produced within one country's border in a specific time. So again, it's like. I'm going to buy a laptop, even though my laptop has all these different pieces, screen, keyboard, whatever. It's just what's the final cost of that laptop? That's And so they put all these goods and services together and they say for a country, what's all the finished goods and services uh, produced within that border? Boom. That's the that's the GDP. Now, right now, this is a chart showing in uh, GDP of U.S. in 2022. It's now 2024. I think in 2023, the GDP is now up to $27 trillion in gross domestic product. So guess who's close near us? China has $20 trillion in terms of their gross domestic product of all their products, goods, and services. So very important for you to understand. The next thing that I want you to understand is these these terms, recession, depression, and stagflation. So recession is two successive uh, quarters of declining GDP. Okay, what does that mean? That means the GDP is declining for two quarters, like, you know, when a quarter is three months. So over a period of six months, if GDP is declining, they're like, oh my goodness, we're in a recession right now. There may be other factors to define a, a, a recession, but at least that that's uh, that's the general accepted term. A depression is a much harder to define, right? Because in 1929, when the stock market crashed, well, they said we had a depression for 10 years. So, but we had growth went up and down through all that time. You know, so different people have different definitions of what depression is. I think that the best definition, it just means depressed growth. It's just when you have a significant economic decline, your nation's GDP is slowing down, you may have unemployment rates rising, and maybe your consumer confidence might be suffering. And then there's another term called stagflation. That's like when prices are super high, high inflation, and there's nobody working, the unemployment super high, and just nobody's buying anything. So is that like, the, that's a terrible condition that we have. That happened in the 1970s when, when gas prices were so high, governments did all this type of stuff. And as a result, we had such a high inflation, people were out of work and they still couldn't buy stuff. So again, this is throughout history. This is uh, the GDP that's grown. So you can see, wow, look at all this GDP. And then it declined. And then uh, here we had a recession. So all these gray bars are when we had recessions. Okay, so we see economic growth, recession, economic growth, recession. And then look, we now just keep fluctuating back and forth in our GDP. But I wanted to show you something really interesting right here. Notice how after 1983, we had growth, it was around 12%, then it went down, but then it only went up around 6%, and then it went down, and then it only went around, you know, 6%, and then down, up, and down, and up. And then look at now, it, we're not going back to the 1950s of having 20% GDP. Now we're looking, and we had this huge recession, and now GDP is kind of very, very low every single year ever since 2008 financial crisis. The reason why I wanna show this to you is because according to Steve King and Jim Rickards, they see our economy stagnating, okay? People, politicians will like to share on the news, the economy is great, unemployment, you know, we're growing, but it's like, are we really growing? We're only growing like certain, like a couple percentage points, you know, nothing like we used to. 
Jim Rickard says that we're in a Great Depression right now and we don't even know it. You know, most people don't realize it. And then uh, Steve King says we're just, you know, have a stagnant economy. And and they each have given different reasons on why that they're happening, but they both kind of say the same thing, that we're just kind of like a zombie economy right now. So if you want to ask me my opinion on the state of the economy, I just, I, you know, I would defer to those two individuals that are saying we're, we're, we're a stagnant economy. Our economy is not doing that well. And I'll show you some other figures that show that. Uh, the next thing that they'll talk about in the news is unemployment rate. They're like, wait, unemployment's really low right now. It's only around 3%. Like, this is great. You know, if we start to get 4 or 5%, then we know, oh, my goodness, look at all these people are out of work. The unemployment rate is the unemployed individuals, people who are not working, but are still seeking work divided by the total labor force. And they multiply that by 100. The problem is, is that when we're in a recession and when we're things are going down and people are not really buying or, 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 or anything, and then people are going to have to lay people off, companies don't just lay people off right away. They struggle. They try to do everything they can. They cut costs and stuff like that. And so sometimes by the time a recession is already happening, then people get laid off. That's why they call this a lagging indicator, right? So, you know, Right now, the Fed and all these other economics will say, hey, the economy is still doing well. Employment rate is 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 still low. We're like, yeah, but don't you realize it's a lagging indicator? Once we have been might be already in recession right now in the U.S. and you guys are looking at unemployment rates, but that, that that's the last thing that's going to happen after the economy slows down. So, again, I'm, it's just important for you to know. Uh, uh, Kieran, so glad you could join us. Question, does this explain the state of the competitive job market? People have a difficult time getting good jobs. Wow, what a great question that is, Kieran. The, there's so many reasons why, what economists say of why it's so difficult for people to get jobs. I, I'm going to share with you just off the top of my head why that may be happening, okay? Number one is we were all kind of sold a bag of goods, okay? Uh, and that bag of goods says, hey, if we get a job and we get a degree, then we're gonna, you know, if we go to college and get our four-year degree, two-year degree, we do that because we wanna get a job. But what we ended up happening is we have a lot of people going after jobs uh, that there's just so many people going after those same jobs. So that's, that's a high demand, right? And little supply. Right. So that's why one factor, again, just one factor, Kieran, on why people might be struggling, having a difficult finding jobs. Um, there's so many other factors from from it. Uh, it could be the state of the economy. It could be, you know, the jobs that people want and expect are just not available. Right. It could be, um, you know, uh, like so many other kind of factors. I can't go to all, all, into all of them, but. Here, I hope that at least answers one factor of the question, but I'm going to lead it to this, this uh, next slide because I think it will also kind of address it. This is something that I learned about Jim Rickards that's not really talked about. It's called the labor participation rate. And I'm like, how come I've never heard of this? They don't really talk about this that much. The labor participation rate is the sum of, um, uh, of employed and unemployed persons as a share of the total total workforce, meaning anyone who's 16 years old who has the capability to work, you know, if those people are able to work, well, guess what? That's that's your labor participation. And what they're finding is, look at what's happening. In the 2000s, we had 67%. You imagine if 67% of the population is working, producing goods, it's like, wow, that's really going to grow your GDP. That's another way of measuring look at all these productive people that are working. But ever since that time, look at, it's been declining, 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 declining. And it went up a little bit. You know, uh, we had the 2020 crash uh, of the pandemic. And look, it's still uh, very low, this participation rate. That is why we're going to have low GDP. Now, going back to Kieran's question, there's a lot of other factors, um, a lot of, uh, of, of reasons why we may be having low labor participation. 
one of that those reasons could be economic policies. Remember how uh, a lot of people with the whole COVID pandemic, they're like, I'm just going to retire, right? A lot of these people who are not in the labor force, may, who are not maybe working or employed, maybe they just gave up on actually going to work. Remember, the unemployment rate, but going back here, uh, Kieran, this is people who are working and people unemployed seeking work. What about the people who just give up and they're like, I can't get a job. There's no even point. I'm just going to move home and live with mom, move with dad, live with my grandparents. Those are called discouraged workers. They are not even reflected in that. So maybe that's what one of the reasons why there's such a low labor, labor participation. Maybe a wife who would want to work and they find out that how oh, childcare is so expensive that you know what, I'm just gonna have to take care of the kids at home. Boom, labor participation rate goes down. They're not considered unemployed. They're not even looking for work anymore because healthcare costs are so much, you see? So there's, it's so complex, you know? Yeah, um, and then your other comment, Karen, it's also affecting people's ability to buy homes as well. Well, prices of homes are going so up so high and we're gonna kind of cover that a little bit in this presentation, maybe more in the second one. But yeah, people can't afford it. And so that's why, uh, you know, people are living in, moving in with each other uh, as a family just to kind of save on rent or save, you know, uh, and, and, and millennials and the, now the Gen Z, they're just almost kind of giving up that they can't afford homes, right? So again, this is, I think, is a good indication where the state of the economy is happening. All right, I, for the sake of time, I got to keep going. Uh, uh, the last couple of definitions, velocity of money. Uh, it means the changeover of money. If I want to go to the movies, right, you know, uh, I, I go to a, you know, take an Uber, go to the movies. So I'm spending money. I'm, I, I'm spending a dollar. And guess what? When I pay that Uber driver, guess what? That Uber driver is going to use that money to go buy some food from, you know, McDonald's or whatever. So every dollar that I'm spending, it's actually, and those people are then spending that dollar. And then, you know, all these other things are doing, that's the velocity of money. It's the changeover of the money. But what happens if I don't spend that money? What if I decide not to go to the movies? Well, that dollar is not being spent. Or what if I pay the Uber, go to the movies, but what if the Uber driver's like, I need to save money, man. I don't even want to buy McDonald's food. I'm just going to eat from home. You know, like, do you understand is that if, if the money is not being circulated, it's being measured, that means people are spending less and less money. They're, it's not turning over. And notice what's been happening ever since 2000s. The velocity of money has been going down, 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 down. So this is what I want to share with you all. That means this is a challenge. Okay, even though it declined in, in 2020 during the pandemic, it went up a little bit, but it's not going back to the levels that it once has. There is something going on in the economy that is getting people, preventing them from actually going out and spending money. What is that reason? Well, I can tell you what uh, I would say, I would argue Steve Keen might say. Steve Keen might say the reason why is because everybody's in debt. People have mortgages, people have credit card debts, and the debts are just getting so high of private debt that people don't want to spend money anymore, right? They just want to conserve. Uh, 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 you know, corporations, their debts are getting so high that they don't want to spend any more money. Companies don't want to hire people. So again, it's a psychological phenomenon. If, if everybody stops spending money, there is no economy. So important thing to understand is the velocity of money. Last couple of concepts. Treasury bonds. Remember how I said that the U U.S. government pays uh, for stuff by either taxing people or they borrow money. How do they borrow money? Well, they'll say, hey, if you pay us money, we'll give you some interest, right? And so this is an example of a 10-year bond uh, paid at 4% interest, you know, uh, and that's great. Now, I know that this is a nice shiny certificate, but now it's all digital. It's all, all zeros and numbers, you know, all through computers. But this is what a treasury bond looks like, okay? I get a treasury bond for uh, 10 years, a 10-year treasury bond, and I, they're going to give me a 4% interest. So guess what? I'm going to get this little coupon, 4% every year. So every year, I'm going to get 40 bucks. Nice. And then on the 10th year, I'm going to get $1,000. Now, technically, I have the ability to, after one year, I could sell this treasury bond and I'll get the $1,000 because somebody else is going to want to buy it and they want to get those coupons as well and get that money. 
So this is a very important concept for you guys to understand and know that this market exists and uh, a lot of other countries will, uh, people, investors will buy U.S. government debt, U.S. treasury bonds. Now, here's another concept that I learned in macroeconomics that I just never understood, but I'm going to explain it to you right now. They, you're going to hear there's always an inverse relationship between bond price percentage or yields and price. Because remember, as we're going to learn, the Fed, the central government, the central bank has the ability to affect interest rates, has the ability to affect these treasury bond yields. Well, guess what happens? What if I go to the government and I'm like, yes, I'm going to buy a 4% uh, 10-year treasury bond. I get $1,000 back. And then what if the bond prices, uh, excuse me, the bond yields change. The next month, the government says, oh, interest rates have changed. Now, if you buy a bond from us, we're going to give you 5% uh, for that $1,000. And I'm like, hey, what the hell? I just bought you, bought a U.S. Treasury bond from you last month for 4%. And now you're selling one for 5%. Now the value of my bond just went down. So that's why the prices go down. And you could have the opposite effect. What if I bought a 4% bond and the bond rates or yields suddenly decline and then the government's only giving you 1%? Woohoo, I feel rich, man. I'm like, I'm the smart one. I got a US bond at 4%. Now my bond price actually values at is much more, $1,047. So I can now sell that and make a little bit of money. So again, this is a very important concept to understand and how... Uh, you know, bonds and treasury bonds and rates and yields can really affect, um, you know, prices. And then the last concept I'm going to share with you is something I learned. Again, I, I learned this from Jim Rickards because he really explained to me, I didn't even think this about this at all. What if I bought a U.S. treasury bond at 4% and after one year, I'm going to get $40, woohoo, and then I'm going to sell it. I just made $40, 4% interest. And then uh, guess what? After that year, I buy a new laptop for $1,000. Woo, I have a $40 left over in cash. I'm a high roller, smart investor, right? Because they say, invest your money, grow it. But what happens if you have inflation? Yikes. What if inflation was 4% over the course of that year? So I bought the bond. I got 4% interest. Okay, after one year, I'm saving up. I'm going to use that interest because I want to buy my laptop and my buy my laptop but now inflation's up so this a thousand dollar laptop now cost a thousand forty dollars so that's the difference is you have to look at every um uh interest rate as a nominal interest rate and you always have to say what is the real interest rate is once you actually subtract inflation from it so the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate equals the real rate of interest so guess what you thought you were smart cookies for buying a 4% treasury bond, well, with 4% inflation, that bond, the real interest rate is zero. Kind of sad, right? You know, so this is why inflation is such a big deal, especially when people lose the value of their money. Okay, let's keep going. And then finally, let's talk about the, the key players in the economy. You have the Fed, also known as the central bank. They create the money right? The, they print money, the money supply. They, their goal is try to keep prices stable, right? They don't want too much inflation, don't want deflation, and they want to make sure everybody's employed. Sometimes those <laughs> actually conflict. The head of the Fed is this guy named Jerome Powell. He's a lawyer uh, who's now economist trying to do his thing. We have our Congress. They tax. They pass laws on, on spending, on how much taxes they're going to raise, and they can stimulate the economy by spending money or sending us paychecks. You know, they call that helicopter money, right? Then you have the U.S. Treasury, right? Th those are the people that deal with the U.S. Treasury bonds. They work with the IRS to collect your taxes, pay bills. They manage the Treasury bonds, and they can enforce the tax laws. So the head of the U.S. Treasury Department is Secretary Janet Yellen. And guess what? She was once the Fed chair. So again, there's a kind of uh, same people, uh, different positions. So now that's the basic definitions of the economy, important concepts that I want you to understand. Now, why do leaders need to understand money and the fi coming financial crises and economic crises? Because I want you to eliminate your fear. A leader who's acting out of a fear is not a good leader, right? You have to prepare 
for all the different possibilities. And I want to show you all those different possibilities that can happen. The next thing is we want to, leaders need to know about money and, and the economy because they have to choose the best policies. Different policies have different outcomes. What are the best policies? I don't feel comfortable enough to actually share with you what I think are the best policies because I'm still trying to figure that out. So I want you to join this journey with me to kind of discover. And I'm going to even talk about that in the second training on what are these policies. I think I'm getting close to understanding these policies. If I were could boil it down when I kind of did this training, I think one thing is you have to promote economic growth. So, you know, there are policies that can limit economic growth and policies that can promote economic growth. So economic growth, I think, is a good thing. Uh, the other thing is equal opportunity for economic growth. We have to make sure that people have the ability to grow economically. I think that's kind of self-explanatory, right? Equal opportunity means not just having other people or rich people are able to benefit more than, than other poor people. We should all have an equal shot at, at, at the, at the you know, American dream to be able to work hard, be productive, make money, invest that money and, and, and grow and add value and employ people. And then we have to also avoid autocratic policies and becoming debt slaves. I think that's an important concept for us to understand. There is something dark inherent within the humans where we love to control others, okay? And, and it's the dark side of us and that we have to be aware of it. And many people, many policies, governments can want to do this, right? They want to actually control people. And, and guess what? Anytime a government wants to control you, they're always going to share with you that this is for your best interest. <laughs> I'm trying to help you by protecting you. I need to protect you from yourself, you know? And the, the other danger is, you know, debt can get so high that we can become slaves to debt, right? And this has happened throughout history where, you know, even during the times of serfdom and plots of lands and people would work and they would, you know, and, and people, you would say, well, you're free to leave and you could work anywhere else, but it's like, yeah, but I have such high debts that, I'm a slave. I don't really have economic freedom because I have to keep paying off this uh, off this, uh, you know, debt that I have. And I think that there's a real big problem, especially right with banks right now. There's a term called usury where people banks can charge such high usury rates. Do you know credit cards can get up to 25 percent? How are people supposed to grow and borrow money to help like buy a car, buy a business, you know, you know, I think it's, I'm very grateful to credit cards to be able to allow people to buy and, and, and spend money. But, but to me, from my perspective, I think these rates are, 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 uh, you know, are, are too darn high. I don't know what they should be, but it's something that I think can really limit people's freedom uh, and get, and make them become a slave and they'll never get out of it. And they'll end up, even if they can work their whole lives paying off, they're just going to pay off the interest and never pay back the principal. So uh, Steve Keen also talks about in his book that this always happens throughout history and the only way to resolve it is to provide a debt jubilee. We need the debt gets so high that we need to say, okay, everybody, debt's so high, we need to wipe out these debts and we need to start over again. Otherwise, people are not going to grow economically. There are different thoughts and opinions about that and, and it could be quite controversial, but I'll talk to you a little bit more later on what Steve Keen thinks is how we should have a debt jubilee. I'll just tell you right now, he thinks that what we should do is give people money and make that money used to pay off debt. But the people who save money and don't have debt, they're gonna say, hey, what the hell, that's not fair. Well, he says, well, you should give them both money so that way that they can say, all right, you pay off your debt and you can use that money to invest whatever you want but at least we can clear off that debt and grow our economy. So that's Steve Keen's uh, uh, perspective. I'll share you later what Jim Rickards and other people's perspectives are, okay? We need elect leaders with the best policies, and then we have to avoid left and right bias. What do I mean by that? Well, the left, uh, people on the left, liberal progressives, again, I'm gonna make some very big generalizations. They tend to believe that government is good, right? We should use government to help people to have a tax system, you know, tax the wealthier, tax the rich. And so therefore we can help more people, right? Now, the challenges with that is government is not 
good or bad. Government can be both good or bad, right? I'm very happy that we have a government, right? A government can help us make sure that we have clean water. They can create rules and regulations to prevent people from taking advantage of other people. Um, but also governments can be very inefficient. They can slow things down, right? Uh, so uh, it's not that government is good or government's bad. It's just that you know, uh, we're tr still trying to find out how can we have an efficient government and and what, what how big should that government be? What should that size be? Now, people on the right tend to or, or we want to elect good government, right? Good policies with competent people on the right. You may have conservatives that says, no, I believe in less government. You know, I think by uh, I need you to start taxing me less. I want more money in my pocket. I don't trust the government. Um, and, and I think I can better use my money and my choices than, let's say, the government might. Right. So just understand that, you know, there are some good arguments for that. Right. If we tax everybody and, you know, all, all, all you know, that that there's less money in your pocket to actually spend money to stimulate the economy. So again, I'm not here to choose left or right. My always opinion here in elective society is to be nonpartisan and say, I don't, I don't assign myself to any political party because if as soon as I choose a side, guess what? I lose my objectivity. I want to know, I want to be almost like a scientist. Okay. Yes, you have a theory. Test it out. Does it work? Okay. You have a theory. Test it out. Does it work? I don't want me blinded just because I want to, oh, the herd is going this way. And so I want to be accepted and liked. So I'm just going to say what they say and go along. You guys are bad. I'm right. I'm smart. You're dumb. Again, I think you should avoid that. Listen to both sides is my, my perspective. Okay. So how do we eliminate fear uh, and prepare for all the uh, possibilities? Well, history repeats or rhymes. So you can't predict the future, but you can prepare for the worst case scenarios. What are the worst case scenarios? Deflation, which is another version of a recession or a depression, right? Prices are declining. People are not spending money, whatever it is, you know, uh, and it's a problem. Inflation, prices are going so high, but guess what? When prices are going high and it's feeding on itself, it becomes hyperinflation. And that can be very dangerous. You know, right now, I believe Argentina is having a hyperinflation as we speak. Uh, uh, banks are limiting how many, how much money, like forty dollars, people can pull out of the bank because they don't want people to spend all the money because inflation is happening so fast that they're just going to want to get rid of it as fast as possible and buy things because the money's not going to be worth the same. It's going to be worthless, you know. And, and they're trying to stop that. So hyperinflation can be very dangerous. Stagflation is just where high prices and low unemployment, right? So we need to know all about these things. Now, here's another point that I want to actually share with you. There is a difference between a financial crisis and an economic crisis. I had no idea. Only Jim Rickards taught me about this. Okay, I had to learn it from him. A financial crisis is where you're like, woo, I have all these assets. I have my stock market. Woo, I, it's worth, you know, uh, S&P 500. It's worth $5,000. Like, I'm, I'm so wealthy. But then the next day, 20% decline in your assets. What you thought was really worth this is actually now worth this. <laughs> and, and, and they lose their value. And, and again, people, companies, banks, financial institutions, when you are, are, are dealing with money and, 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 and your assets presses drop suddenly, well, guess what happens? People would say, hey, you know how I gave you my money? I want my money back. And it's like, uh, I use that money to borrow and other money and I now I can't pay you back. You're like, what? So it means I can't pay you back, even though I promised to pay you back. So people start getting really panicky and then they, you know, uh, consumers, businesses, they can't pay down debts. So that's why you have banking crisis, stock crashes, bubbles bursting, things like that. This is really caused by a psychological phenomenon and a, mon a monetary phenomenon. If there's not enough money liquid in the system, when people say, give me that money right now, it's like, I don't have that. That causes people to panic, right? They, they they had an illusion that they had all this money, but in reality, they didn't. And guess what? It happens all throughout history. We had a financial crisis in 1797, 1837, 1857. Can you believe all these financial crises happen? This is just a natural state of a capitalist system. People borrow money 
you know, spend it, don't spend it wisely, get excessive, uh, have this euphoric feeling. And then suddenly they're not investing that money wisely and it crashes and they deleverages. And, 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 and guess what? Now, now a, a, a panic happens. Now, our government does different things to prevent this from happening, as we're going to learn, like the Fed, they will kind of create money, give credit so that people don't uh, have a fear. Like right now, if people were taking money out of the banks, first of all, they could totally shut down the banks. Maybe they might even just say, guess what? You know, take as much money as you want. We're going to print more money, you know, because we just don't want to have uh, a financial crisis to happen because it can cause a lot of problems. An economic crisis is an economic downturn where GDP is declining, right? It could also have low employment or, you know, rising high unemployment, I meaning people are out of work. And it could also uh, have a liquidity crisis. And here's the important thing to understand is that a financial crisis can happen at the same time as an economic crisis, or a financial crisis can lead to an economic crisis. So when did we have both an economic crisis and a financial crisis? Well, guess what? It was the 2008 great financial crisis, <laughs> the great recession, right? Um, and, and, and the stock market crashed, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And guess what? We had uh, a recession. So um, economic crisis can include high inflation, high deflation or recession, declining uh, two quarters of declining GDP. So we had it just, this is just reason example, because I didn't want to put so many dates, 1973, 1980, 1981. You're going to learn in the videos that they say, oh, recessions happen every eight years. Well, look, it happened one year right after the other. 1990, 2000, 2007, you get the idea. 2007 was the longest recession we had one year and six months and 2020 recession produced the most severe decline. Now, people will say the 2020 pandemic, we had the fastest recovery of that recession, well, we did, but that's because the government did a lot of things to prevent that, to get us back out of that recession. So I'm going to show you this quick uh, nine minute video, and it's going to highlight um, some of these major events in history. I can't, we don't need to go over all these financial crises, but there's important ones that you need to know about, and it has to relate to these economic principles that I'm trying to teach you. So 1920, there was hyperinflation. Weimar Republic, which is at the time before it was Germany, they started printing up so much money that they were handing out trillion dollars. People were having buckets of money and they couldn't spend it fast enough. And the reason why they were having this, this hyperinflation, this is called demand pull inflation. It's a psychology principle. People expect the prices to increase. So like, oh my goodness, prices are increased. Buy it now, buy it now before it goes higher. And so then, oh, because so many people are buying, it's the velocity of money is increasing. Remember how we talked about the changeover money? Every time you get money, spend it as quickly as possible because it's losing its value. This is very dangerous. That can cause a hyperinflation. The next thing was the 1929 to 1930 deflation. It was so bad that they called it a depression. <laughs> you know, it was a recession and a depression. And that's where velocity decline. People were scared. They don't want to spend money. All right. Even if they had money, they didn't want to spend it. Psychological, right? That has to release some velocity of money. 1970s, 80s, we had high inflation. That was cost push inflation because gas prices so go up. Like they, everybody's buying the same things, but now everything's going up because gasoline is going up so much. So guess what? If gasoline prices go up, well, then the, the, the buying the bread off the truck that transports that bread from point A to point B, well, now they have to charge me higher bread prices and higher egg prices. So everything can go up. You know, cost push inflation is what we had happen right now in the 2020 pandemic with the global pandemic, recession. But why? We still have the inflation. Why? Because there were shortages of goods, right? Stuff from China. It was, uh, it was you know, uh, all those problems. So there's different types of inflation that you need to understand. Stagflation happened in the 1980s, deflation in the 08, and a global recession in, in 2020. So let's watch this fun video because I think it really does a good job explaining this. Okay, let's do it. In Germany in 1923, people were doing strange things, like using money to wallpaper their houses and burning money for heat. What was going on? Had they all gone crazy? Nope. 
In the early 1920s, Germany was in the grip of something called hyperinflation. In order to pay massive reparations to the Allies after World War I, Germany printed a lot of their currency, the mark. One result of all this additional money was higher and higher prices. By November 1923, it took a trillion marks to buy one U.S. dollar. There were 1,000 billion mark notes in circulation. The mark was effectively meaningless. A similar situation developed in Zimbabwe a few years ago. Starting in 2007, inflation grew rapidly. Rapidly, like really, really rapidly. By September 2008, the International Monetary Fund estimated the annual inflation rate at 489 billion percent. In practical terms, the Zimbabwean dollar lost 99.9 percent of its value between 2007 and 2008. It's hard to even imagine what that looks like. Prices nearly doubled every 24 hours, and businesses revised prices several times a day. In June 2008, the Economic Times reported that a loaf of bread now costs what 12 new cars did a decade ago. The government issued currency in huge denominations to keep up with rising prices. The million dollar bill, the billion dollar bill, and finally in 2009, the hundred trillion dollar bill, the largest denomination of currency ever issued. The good news was that everyone was a billionaire, but the bad news was that those dollars were virtually worthless. One definition of hyperinflation is when a country experiences a monthly inflation rate of over 50 percent or around 13,000 percent annual inflation. But believe it or not, Zimbabwe's recent inflation isn't unique and it's not the worst inflation in history. In fact, the worst was in Hungary in 1946. Between July 1940 in August 1946, the price level in Hungary rose by a factor of 3 times 10 to the 25th. And yes, anytime you have to express your inflation rate using scientific notation, that's a bad thing. Besides the obvious confusion over what prices to charge for things, why is hyperinflation so bad? Well, inflation, and especially hyperinflation, erodes wealth. In Zimbabwe, people who had worked their whole lives and saved up for retirement saw their savings just wiped out. Extreme inflation also forces people to spend as quickly as possible rather than save or lend. So there's no money available to fund new businesses. And all that uncertainty limits foreign investment and trade. So hyperinflation is bad. But how does it happen? Let's go to the thought bubble. So we're simplifying this stuff a lot, but the root of the problem in both Weimar Germany and Zimbabwe was that the government was paying their bills by printing new money. An increase in the money supply can have two effects. It can increase output or increase prices or some combination of the two. Inflation starts when output is pushed to capacity and can't rise much further, but policymakers continue to increase the money supply. In theory, once output is maximized, the more money you print, the more inflation you'll get. Simple, right? Well, that doesn't fully explain why Germany's or Zimbabwe's inflation rose exponentially. Was the government really printing that much money? Not exactly. After a couple of years of doubling prices, people started to expect high inflation, and that changed their behavior. Say you're planning to buy a new refrigerator, and you expect prices to rise quickly. You buy it as soon as possible before the prices had a chance to change. But with everyone following that logic, dollars start to circulate faster and faster and faster. Economists call the number of times a dollar is spent per year the velocity of money. When people spend their money as quickly as they get it, that increases velocity, which pushes inflation up even faster. You get a vicious cycle of higher prices, which lead to expectations of higher prices, which lead to higher prices. The hyperinflation in Germany ended when the government replaced the worthless mark with a new currency. Zimbabwe ended its hyperinflation by abandoning its currency altogether. Now its citizens use U.S. dollars or currencies from neighboring countries. The good news is that prices have since stabilized and real GDP has begun to increase. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So if you ever control a national economy, try to avoid hyperinflation. You might also want to stay away from depressions. A depression is kind of a hard thing to define, but basically it's when real GDP falls and keeps falling for a long period of time. This has all sorts of terrible effects like high unemployment and falling prices. Before the 1930s, economists used the term depression to describe sustained falls in GDP. But after the Great Depression, economists started using the word recession for downturns to avoid association with the 1930s. Yes, calling it a depression was just too depressing. When the stock market crashed in 1929, it didn't just cause problems for stockbrokers. Everyone freaked out and stopped spending, and the economy ground to a halt. Of course, that's not the only reason for the Great Depression. Actually, there's still a lot of debate about the causes. Anyway, when economies fall into deep recessions, there are more workers than there are jobs, and more output than consumers want to buy. So both income and prices fall. Central banks can try to use expansionary monetary policy to speed up the economy. So, for example, in the U.S., the Federal Reserve can lower interest rates, and this encourages consumers and businesses to take out loans and hopefully get the economy going again. But if people start changing their expectations and anticipate further price declines, they'll change their behavior in ways that work against the central bank. Like if you're planning to buy a refrigerator and you expect prices to fall, you're going to wait to get a lower price. But if everyone follows that same logic, then spending declines, and so does the velocity of money. That leads to further price declines and a vicious cycle of falling prices, which leads to expectations of lower prices, which actually leads to lower prices. It also leads to layoffs at the refrigerator factory, and so on and so on and so on. This is called a liquidity trap, and some 
Some economists believe it's a big factor in worsening economic downturns, including the Great Depression. Speaking of the Great Depression, after the initial crash of 1929, the Federal Reserve dropped interest rates to zero. Output and prices fell, and regular people started to expect further price declines. Unemployment rose to 25 percent, and the average family income dropped by around 40 percent. This is not great. Once interest rates hit zero and prices were still falling, the central bank was in a bind. Continuing deflation meant that borrowing money was a bad deal, even with no interest. The money you pay back in the future would have more buying power than the money you originally borrowed. This discouraged people from buying homes or cars and discouraged businesses from borrowing to expand capacity. In fact, getting out of the depression took nearly a decade, and it wasn't really monetary policy that put an end to it. It was the massive government spending of World War II. Okay, you don't want hyperinflation you don't want depressions, you also don't want stagflation. That's when output slows down or stops or stagnates at the same time that prices rise. So stagnant economy plus inflation equals stagflation. Get it? It's a portmanteau. The U.S. experienced stagflation starting in the 1970s after a series of supply shocks, including a rise in oil prices and, believe it or not, a die-off of Peruvian anchovies, which were important for animal feed and fertilizers. This combination of events meant the economy couldn't produce as much. The Fed tried to address this by boosting the money supply and cutting interest rates, but output couldn't rise very much because of low productivity and the oil shortage. So all that extra money just triggered inflation. It got even worse when people began to adjust their inflation expectations. Businesses started to expect costs to rise even further, so they laid off workers, and that put the economy back into a recession. When the Fed boosted the money supply again, that raised inflation expectations even more. This ended in the early 80s when a new Federal Reserve chairman took over. His name was Paul Volcker. He actually cut the money supply and raised interest rates dramatically. Output plummeted and unemployment reached 10%. But prices stopped rising, and so did inflation expectations. The economy gradually recovered, and Paul Volcker got the credit for ending stagflation. So hyperinflation, deflation, depression, stagflation, they're all extreme economic circumstances. But these extremes show us why it's so important to measure and understand the overall economy. In some cases, government action or inaction made things worse. And in other cases, the government helped get the economy back on its feet. But it's important to keep in mind that the economy is made up of collective decisions of individuals. It's people like us. Our expectations matter. If enough people fear a recession, they're going to decrease their spending, and that's going to cause a recession. Next week, we're going to look at different economic schools of thought but all right so I, I hope you found that video as insightful as it was for me because again the main takeaway that i want you to get out of that is how important psychology goes into the economy right they can print money they can you know raise interest rates decrease interest rates so there's a lot of things that that the government can do but they can't control the psychology of people so let's now go to uh, the understanding of the economy, according to Ray Dalio. Now, again, it's a 30 minute video. And of course, we don't have 30 minutes to actually show the whole video. But what I will say is I will kind of give you an overview of that video, because um, what ends up happening is that in this video, there's some key concepts that I really want you to understand. The first one is he simplifies it in this video, but he talks about this formula about MV equals P uh, times Y. We're going to talk about this more in the second training, but this understands why, how much money you have in circulation plus the velocity of your money equals how much price does it cost and the yield of your GDP, right? So again, we're not going to go into it right now. That's a little bit more complex, but he just mentions it briefly at the bottom of the screen. And I want you guys to see if you guys can catch it. But that's too complicated. So he basically co covers these main points. Credit is the most important thing in the economy. The economy is based on uh, credit and transactions. The Fed or the bank adjust interest rates and they print money. They don't really print money. It's actually a simplification. They create credit and banks can even create even more credit. Governments can borrow money, like I told you before about with U.S. Treasury bonds. They can tax people. They can spend money and provide stimulus. Uh, the economy grows through cycles. Uh, capitalism has, you know, booms and busts. Uh, but all this excess credit leads to an expansion of the economy, but debt gets too high. And then when those businesses that don't do well and they're not people are not buying those goods and services, well, then they have to then say, hey, we were too euphoric. We're not going to be able to pay back all this money that we borrowed. So then they have to deleverage. They have to sell their stuff. They have to uh, you know, have maybe other company buy them out. So it's a deleveraging process, which results in lowering of prices. 
But if too much of that happens, it can lead to a deflation or a recession. So the only way out of it is what Ray Dalio says is you could either um, bring debt down by either spending cuts, right? You know, um, you know, not spending as much money. Uh, governments like to call this term austerity. It's always so funny with all these economic terms. They don't use the simple word. They always have to create new words to explain the same thing, right? Debt restructuring mean, hey, I promised you back uh, uh, this money with 10% interest, but can we just restructure it because I can't pay you back? Can I pay you 5% interest over 30 years instead of 10 years, you know, whatever it may be? Uh, wealth redistribu re re redistribution, taxing and spending, printing new money. But again, like you said, they can print all this money, but it could lead to inflation. So let's watch this video now. And, and, and we're not going to watch the whole thing, but we're going to watch a, a clip of it. When prices rise, I it. or they don't agree on how it works. And this is let how the economic machine works in 30 minutes. The economy works like a simple machine, but many people don't understand it, or they don't agree on how it works. And this has led to a lot of needless economic suffering. I feel a deep sense of responsibility to share my simple but practical economic template. Though it's unconventional, it has helped me to anticipate and to sidestep the global financial crisis, and it has worked well for me for over 30 years. Let's begin. Though the economy might seem complex, it works in a simple, mechanical way. It's made up of a few simple parts and a lot of simple transactions that are repeated over and over again a zillion times. These transactions are, above all else, driven by human nature, and they create three main forces that drive the economy. Number one, productivity growth. Number two, the short-term debt cycle. And number three, the long-term debt cycle. We'll look at these three forces and how laying them on top of each other creates a good template for tracking economic movements and figuring out what's happening now. Let's start with the simplest part of the economy, transactions. An economy is simply the sum of the transactions that make it up. And a transaction is a very simple thing. You make transactions all the time. Every time you buy something, you create a transaction. Each transaction consists of a buyer exchanging money or credit with a seller for goods, services, or financial assets. Credit spends just like money, so adding together the money spent and the amount of credit spent, you can know the total spending. The total amount of spending drives the economy. If you divide the amount spent by the quantity sold, you get the price. And that's it. That's a transaction. It's the building block of the economic machine. All cycles and all forces in an economy are driven by transactions. So if we can understand transactions, we can understand the whole economy. A market consists of all the buyers and all the sellers making transactions for the same thing. For example, there is a wheat market, a car market, a stock market, and markets for millions of things. An economy consists of all of the transactions in all of its markets. If you add up the total spending and the total quantity sold in all of the markets, you have everything you need to know to understand the economy. It's just that simple. People, businesses, banks, and governments all engage in transactions the way I just described, exchanging money and credit for goods, services, and financial assets. The biggest buyer and seller is the government, which consists of two important parts, a central government that collects taxes and spends money, and a central bank, which is different from other buyers and sellers because it controls the amount of money and credit in the economy. It does this by influencing interest rates and printing new money. For these reasons, as we'll see, the central bank is an important player in the flow of credit. I want you to pay attention to credit. Credit is the most important part of the economy and probably the least understood. It's the most important part because it's the biggest and most volatile part. Just like buyers and sellers go to the market to make transactions, so do lenders and borrowers. Lenders usually want to make their money into more money and borrowers usually want to buy something they can't afford, like a house or a car, or they want to invest in something like starting a business. Credit can help both lenders and borrowers get what they want. Borrowers promise to repay the amount they borrow, called principal, plus an additional amount, called interest. When interest rates are high, there is less borrowing because it's expensive. When interest rates are low, borrowing increases because it's cheaper. When borrowers promise to repay, and lenders believe them, Credit is created. Any two people can agree to create credit out of thin air. That seems simple enough, but credit is tricky because it has different names. As soon as credit is created, it immediately turns into debt. Debt is both an asset to the lender and a liability to the borrower. 
In the future, when the borrower repays the loan plus interest, the asset and the liability disappear and the transaction is settled. So why is credit so important? Because when a borrower receives credit, he is able to increase his spending. And remember, spending drives the economy. This is because one person's spending is another person's income. Think about it. Every dollar you spend, someone else earns, and every dollar you earn, someone else has spent. So when you spend more, someone else earns more. When someone's income rises, it makes lenders more willing to lend him money because now he's more worthy of credit. A credit-worthy borrower has two things, the ability to repay and collateral. Having a lot of income in relation to his debt gives him the ability to repay. In the event that he can't repay, he has valuable assets to use as collateral that can be sold. This makes lenders feel comfortable lending him money. So increased income allows increased borrowing which allows increased spending. And since one person's spending is another person's income, this leads to more increased borrowing and so on. This self-reinforcing pattern leads to economic growth and is why we have cycles. Okay, I'm gonna pause it here. I'm gonna fast forward it. Again, one of the actions uh, steps after this training is I do recommend you watch this whole entire 30 minute video, but there's, he goes to over like booms and busts. And I, there's something that I really wanna share with you about what happens uh, when we're actually in an economic decline, okay? Let me, let's do it right here. When people spend less, prices go down. We call this deflation. Economic activity decreases and we have a recession. If the recession becomes too severe and inflation is no longer a problem, the central bank will lower interest rates to cause everything to pick up again. With low interest rates, debt repayments are reduced and borrowing and spending pick up and we see another expansion. As you can see, the economy works like a machine. In the short-term debt cycle, spending is constrained only by the willingness of lenders and borrowers to provide and receive credit. When credit is easily available, there's an economic expansion. When credit isn't easily available, there's a recession. And note that this cycle is controlled primarily by the central bank. The short-term debt cycle typically lasts five to eight years and happens over and over again for decades. But notice that the bottom and top of each cycle finish with more growth than the previous cycle and with more debt. Why? Because people push it. They have an inclination to borrow and spend more instead of paying back debt. It's human nature. Because of this, over long periods of time, debts rise faster than incomes, creating the long-term debt cycle. Despite people becoming more indebted, lenders even more freely extend credit. Why? Because everyone thinks things are going great. People are just focused on what's been happening lately. And what's been happening lately? Incomes have been rising. Asset values are going. The stock market roars. It's a boom. It pays to buy goods, services, and financial assets with borrowed money. When people do a lot of that, we call it a bubble. So even though debts have been growing, incomes have been growing nearly as fast to offset them. Let's call the ratio of debt to income the debt burden. So long as incomes continue to rise, the debt burden stays manageable. At the same time, asset values soar. People borrow huge amounts of money to buy assets as investments, causing their prices to rise even higher. People feel wealthy. So even with the accumulation of lots of debt, rising incomes and asset values help borrowers remain credit worthy for a long time. But this obviously cannot continue forever. And it doesn't. Over decades, debt burdens slowly increased, creating larger and larger debt repayments. At some point, debt repayments start growing faster than incomes, forcing people to cut back on their spending. And since one person's spending is another person's income, incomes begin to go down, which makes people less credit worthy, causing borrowing to go down. Debt repayments continue to rise, which makes spending drop even further, and the cycle reverses itself. This is the long-term debt peak. Debt burdens have simply become too big. For the United States, Europe, and much of the rest of the world, this happened in 2008. It happened for the same reason it happened in Japan in 1989 and in the United States back in 1929. Now the economy begins deleveraging. In a deleveraging, people cut spending, incomes fall, credit disappears, asset prices drop, banks get squeezed. The stock market crashes, social tensions rise, and the whole thing starts to feed on itself the other way. As incomes fall and debt repayments rise, borrowers get squeezed. No longer credit worthy, credit dries up, 
and borrowers can no longer borrow enough money to make their debt repayments. Scrambling to fill this hole, borrowers are forced to sell assets. The rush to sell assets floods the market at the same time as spending falls. This is when the stock market collapses, the real estate market tanks, and banks get into trouble. As asset prices drop, the value of the collateral borrowers can put up drops. This makes borrowers even less creditworthy. People feel poor. Credit rapidly disappears. Less spending, less income, less wealth, less credit, less borrowing, and so on. It's a vicious cycle. This appears similar to a recession, but the difference here is that interest rates can't be lowered to save the day. In a recession, lowering interest rates works to stimulate borrowing. However, in a deleveraging, lowering interest rates doesn't work because interest rates are already low and soon hit 0%. So the stimulation ends. Interest rates in the United States hit 0% during the deleveraging of the 1930s and again in 2008. The difference between a recession and a deleveraging is that in a deleveraging, borrowers' debt burdens have simply gotten too big and can't be relieved by lowering interest rates. Lenders realize that debts have become too large to ever be fully paid back. Borrowers have lost their ability to repay and their collateral has lost value. They feel crippled by the debt. They don't even want more. Lenders stop lending, borrowers stop borrowing. Think of the economy as being not creditworthy, just like an individual. So what do you do about a deleveraging? Mm -hmm. The problem is debt burdens are too high and they must come down. There are four ways this can happen. One, people, businesses, and governments cut their spending. Two, debts are reduced through defaults and restructurings. Three, wealth is redistributed from the haves to the have-nots. And finally, four, the central bank prints new money. These four ways have happened in every deleveraging in modern history. Usually, spending is cut first. As we just saw, people, businesses, and even governments tighten their belts and cut their spending so that they can pay down their debt. This is often referred to as austerity. When borrowers stop taking on new debts and start paying down old debts, you might expect the debt burden to decrease. But the opposite happens. Because spending is cut, and one man's spending is another man's income, it causes incomes to fall. They fall faster than debts are repaid, and the debt burden actually gets worse. As we've seen, this cut in spending is deflationary and painful. Businesses are forced to cut costs, which means less jobs and higher unemployment. This leads to the next step. Debts must be reduced. Many borrowers find themselves unable to repay their loans, and a borrower's debts are a lender's assets. When a borrower doesn't repay the bank, people get nervous that the bank won't be able to repay them, so they rush to withdraw their money from the bank. Banks get squeezed, and people, businesses, and banks default on their debts. This severe economic contraction is a depression. A big part of a depression is people discovering much of what they thought was their wealth isn't really there. Let's go back to the bar. When you bought a beer and put it on a bar tab, you promised to repay the bartender. Your promise became an asset of the bartender. But if you break your promise, if you don't pay him back and essentially default on your bar tab, then the asset he has isn't really worth anything. It has basically disappeared. Many lenders don't want their assets to disappear and agree to debt restructuring. Debt restructuring means lenders get paid back less or get paid back over a longer time frame or at a lower interest rate than was first agreed. Somehow, a contract is broken in a way that reduces debt. Lenders would rather have a little of something than all of nothing. Even though debt disappears, debt restructuring causes income and asset values to disappear faster, so the debt burden continues to get worse. Like cutting spending, debt reduction is also painful and deflationary. All of this impacts the central government because lower incomes and less employment means the government collects fewer taxes. At the same time, it needs to increase its spending because unemployment has risen. Many of the unemployed have inadequate savings and need financial support from the government. Additionally, governments create stimulus plans and increase their spending to make up for the decrease in the economy. Governments' budget deficits explode in the deleveraging because they spend more than they earn in taxes. This is what's happening when you hear about the budget deficit on the news. To fund their deficits, governments need to either raise taxes or borrow money. But with incomes falling and so many unemployed, who is the money going to come from? The rich. Since governments need more money and since wealth is heavily concentrated in the hands of a small percentage of the people, governments naturally raise taxes on the wealthy which facilitates a redistribution of wealth in the economy from the haves to the have-nots. The have-nots who are suffering begin to resent the wealthy haves. 
the wealthy haves being squeezed by the weak economy, falling asset prices, and higher taxes begin to resent the have-nots. If the depression continues, social disorder can break out. Not only do tensions rise within countries, they can rise between countries, especially debtor and creditor countries. This situation can lead to political change that can sometimes be extreme. In All right. Great video. Okay. Uh, you guys can always watch that as an action step uh, for the, you know, as when we end this training, but there's still some more stuff that I want to cover for all of you. So let's keep going. So remember how we said why it's important for leaders to understand money and the economy? The, the second reason why it's important is because we have to choose policies that can best serve humanity and the economy. You know, I might even add not only just humanity, but the whole entire planet, right? So when, when it comes to policies, notice how something in the video they talked about. Uh, whenever the Fed is actually increasing or decreasing interest rates or printing money, that has to all deal with U.S. Treasury bonds and working with banks, okay? They call that monetary policy, what the Fed does or the central bank, increase or decrease the money supply. When the government is actually increasing taxes, decreasing taxes, increasing spending, decrease, it's called fiscal policy, Okay, so you have to understand the difference between those two. And then the third thing you have to understand is political or public policy. That's where, you know, you know, politicians, you know, governments are just just making policies that can affect the outcome of the economy. And one of the things that I don't go into too much detail of this, it says beware of dictatorial policies, you know, autocratic policies. There, remember how I was talking before about human nature, how sometimes we like to control other people? Well, I'll, I'm just going to speak his perspective. Uh, Jim Rickards is very, very critical of Janet Yellen and uh, the current uh, Biden administration and what they're doing in the Ukraine war with Russia. Because we don't like Russia, what we have done is uh, our U.S. government has says well, all the money that you use to buy U.S. Treasury bonds, I think it's, uh, I don't quote me on the exact number, I think it's $300 billion, both in the U.S. Uh, banks as well as, you know, Euro, Central Europe banks. We basically said we froze that money and say, I'm sorry, Russia, you don't get to use that money. It's been frozen. And and it's like, whoa, what if that was a bank and your bank just told you, I don't like what you're doing and therefore I'm going to freeze your money and I won't, you can't withdraw it, you can't use it, you can't do anything. So again, the United States has been doing this and people even in Congress right now are talking about seizing that money and giving it to Ukraine. In other words, they're stealing that, you know, as a result of these policies, guess what's happening? Other countries are beginning to start to distrust the United States and our uh, as a reserve currency in, in U.S. Treasury bonds. So they're actually looking to alternatives. And, and so, again, that's a whole other side tangent. But I just want you to be aware that this can actually happen and this actually has consequences. OK, let's keep going. Uh, you know, let's choose better policies because, again, look, these countries are now experiencing high inflation or even hyperinflation because they printed up too much money. And as a result, look at all, all of these countries with the highest inflation as of right now. The also other extreme could happen is governments are not using their money wisely and with policies of both monetary and fiscal policies. These countries are actually experiencing deflation. And I was actually surprised to see China right now is experiencing deflation. Uh, if you read in the news, a lot of the other countries right now are, are uh, in a recession as we speak. So it's very important for us to note this stuff we need to know because it's happening and it's happening into other countries. Um, the other thing when it comes to physical policy where do we want to spend our money and our dollars? Where do we want our tax dollars spent? Now, this was a, a graphic from nationalpriorities.org. I don't know much about the organization, whether it's political points or view. I just love the, the image that they provide. This is where our money is being spent. It's being the majority is spent on Medicare and healthcare. Again, to me, um, Right now, I'll give you my perspective. I believe we have a, a illness profit system where I think that, uh, you know, um, I, I think uh, we need to definitely reform our medical establishment because uh, healthcare costs keep going up and up and up and people can actually go bankrupt uh, with all this high expenses that they're paying. 
for for their medical bills. You know, uh, it's medical bills and education are the only two um, entities that you can't file bankruptcy for, which I find very suspect, right? Everything else you can go bankrupt for, but if you don't have enough money to pay your health insurance or pay your school, they're like, I'm sorry, you're a debt, you're in debt for life, okay, until you pay it off. Something just to be aware of. The Pentagon gets a lot of money. We're paying a lot of interest on the debt. So this is the concern uh, of a lot of conservatives and especially economists is that this is getting so high that it's going to be um, slow our, our economy down, that that money can't be spent on growing the economy. We're going to have to spend so much money just paying back the interest on the debt that we have. So again, I'm not telling you where it should be spent. I'm just sharing with you where our economy is spending the money right now. Uh, other thing about fiscal policy, you'll hear a lot of different conservatives, different economists. It's like, what about our debt? What about our debt? Um, you know, should we, uh, what should our debt actually be? And that's really a hard answer to share. And I would say it really depends on the ratio of your debt to the actual GDP. Now, if you're going to look at you, the United States, we have a certain amount of debt. You know, our debt, I think, is right now uh, $34 trillion, as you can see right here. And our GDP is $27 trillion. So guess what? We're currently at a, a debt to GDP ratio of 124%. According to smart economists um, um, uh, from Harvard, uh, that Jim Rickards references many times, they say that our debt to DB GDP ratio should be around 90%. And now it's at 124%. So according to his perspective, our debt to GDP is way too high. Um, according to Steve Keen, he says, don't just look at U.S. debt, look at all the private debt from household owners to businesses to companies. Our private debt to GDP is currently at 150 percent. And he says that's way too high, you know, and that's why our economy is stagnating. So, again, the important thing for you to realize is that you'll hear a lot of conservatives say, oh, you know what, we need to pay out on our debt. This is not fiscally responsible. You know, this can't be sustained. Pay down the deficit. Stop spending all this money. Uh, you know, we shouldn't afford it. We can't afford it. They're, now, that's a perspective, but you always have to remember, we do have a lot of debt, but it's always in the ratio to the debt to the GDP. And, and both Steve Keen and Jim Rickards and a lot of these other economists basically realize, hey, uh, people, wake up. The government, even though you can look at it as an analogy to your household, the government is not a household. A government can print money, okay? That's the main difference between you, uh, the government, and you. And so just so that you wanted to know what, how much are we in debt, people don't really understand what, what $4 trillion or $6 trillion or $34 trillion is. But if you had to estimate, if we were to make the analogy, even though economists tell us not to do this, our annual family income would be $47,000 if we took away six zeros um, or eight zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight zeros. That's our income. That's how much we're spending uh, with our taxpayer money. So we're spending much more than we're taking in in taxes. And this is how much we owe to people. <laughs> it's a lot, $346,000. So now you can get, start to be a little bit more realistic. There's a, a debt clock that says, oh, our debt clock is going wrong. It's such a concern, fear, fear, fear. But guess what? I'm just sharing you with this information. But again, um, I don't know what all the answers are, but I know that these two economists are starting to warn that our private debt is too high and our GDP uh, debt to GDP is getting a little too high. Okay, let's keep going. And then uh, this is going to be an additional resource video. I'm not going to show it to you because a lot of people on the left, because I was sharing the conservative perspective, hey, we need to be fiscal responsible. I understand. But remember, governments, uh, you know, don't can print their own money. And so they can actually stimulate the economy by spending deficit spending. That's how we can really get out of recessions. But People on the liberal side might say, well, we need to tax the rich, you know, and we need to take all that money and put it into the economy. Well, guess what? This is a video that's over like, I think this was done in 2012. That means it's over 12 years old that Tony Robbins did that says, guess what? People don't understand math and numbers. And so he goes through this whole 10 minute video or longer explaining what would happen? What would we need to do to help pay off all the debt? And, and long story short, you need to 
steal all the money from corporations. You have to check every, you know, take, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars from every different household. Like all this money is going to have to be taken in order to pay down this debt. We're never going to pay down this debt. So again, how are we going to pay it off? Well, as we're going to talk in part two of this training, there's either we either default on the debt. We say, hey, sorry, world, you know how you bought these U.S. Treasury bonds? We can't afford to pay you back. Well, there's another way. We can just inflate it away. We can just devalue. We'll pay you back, but the money we're paying you back is not worth as much before. So that's why governments love printing money, love inflation, because anytime they have to pay back debt, they're paying you back in, in dollars that have less value. Okay, so it's just something to keep in mind. Uh, choose better policies. Uh, when it comes to fiscal policies, what should our taxes be? Do you know that it's not that you should uh, not pay zero taxes, that you should pay so much in taxes? We have so many taxes. We're paying sales tax. We're paying property tax. We're paying income tax. We pay excise tax. And guess what? Smart people, business people, if you tax them too much, they're going to find a way to not pay taxes, right? I remember one study that I really have to find. They said that there's an equilibrium, like people are willing to pay taxes, like it must be around 25%. But if you start charging people more and more, they're going to find a way to say, no, this is unreasonable. Why am I going to spend one third of my life out of one year? I'm going to spend three months just trying to pay the government taxes. So uh, I just wanted to show you a, a graph of the entire United States. This is this is this organization called Madison Trust that just put this data together. If you combine all the taxes, look at where the places are the highest in taxes. New York, which is where I live, and California. And guess what's happening? businesses, people are moving out of these states and are moving to like Florida and, and North Carolina and Tennessee, where they may not have income taxes. And, and businesses are saying like Utah, come here, we'll keep taxes very cheap. Or Texas, come here, we'll keep your taxes very cheap. And businesses love it. And so again, you can't just view us, us versus them. You have to realize that we're all in this together and we need to come up with the best policies that work for everybody. Again, I don't know what the answers are, but my, my part is just to share you this perspective and understanding. And then the other thing is I said, we have to avoid left and right bias. We have economists on the left, Stephanie Kelton, Paul Krugman. You, you may know some of these people. Then we also have people on the right, um, uh, Thomas Sowell, Milton Friedman. I can learn a lot of information from each one of these people. I'm not saying listen to these, listen to these folks. I'm saying listen to all of them. And then like a scientist, take the preponderance of evidence and say, okay, is this true? Does this hold water? Does this model that they have actually work? You know, uh, and and then and then make the best decisions. I think you have to learn both sides. That's why I really appreciate Jim Rickards because he does listen to both sides and he can argue the other person's side. So in training too, uh, Stephanie Kelton is a big proponent. She used to, you know, consult for Bernie Sanders on his campaign, and she's uh, popularizing this term called modern monetary theory. And 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 I'm going to show you a clip in the next training of what she says about modern monetary theory. And then I'm going to show you a clip of Jim Rickards who says Stephanie Kelton about modern monetary theory. Everything she says is true, and he's like, what? I'm like, yes, she's true, but it's dangerous. And then let me recap her arguments, all of them true, but let me show you the other side of why they are dangerous. Again, I'm not saying right or wrong. <clears throat> this is a leadership library series. I'm just sharing you information in my research so that you can continue to do your own research, okay? And then lastly, elect leaders with the best policies. Again, what are those best policies? Like I said, we're all trying to figure out that together. Uh, so I, this, I hope that this just begins that journey for you. So let's recap. What is the state of the economy? Well, according to Steve Keen, we're in a stagnant economy. According to Jim Rickards, we're in a depression. We have now depressed, depressed growth. Why is that? It's because our, our, our debt, to, debt to GDP is so high. The private debt of corporations, companies, individuals is so high. And guess what? What, what do we have right now? We have zombie companies. We have big companies that say, you know what? We can just borrow more and more money and, and just reduce our debt. And guess what? What if, what if the Fed reduced interest rates to zero? What if they stimulate and get all this credit? Well, if they didn't have that easy monetary policy, 
well, guess what's going to happen? Those companies that aren't doing well, they would have to sell, deleverage. But guess what? Some companies are not doing that. They're not delivering. They're like, woo, easy money. Let's take that money and let's buy our stocks. And so let's get the stock market even high. Yes, companies are doing buybacks of stocks, increasing asset prices with all this easy money. So this is why a lot of people will be very critical of uh, you know these policies. These are fine tuning things that can really affect the people because guess what? That means you can enrich companies and that 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 should be defaulting or should be going down, but because they have access to credit, you may be getting zombie combis that just are going to you know st struggle along instead of better companies. Seeing those companies that are deleveraging, buying them, taking over, better management, better leadership to make it happen. Again, this is one perspective. I'm just sharing it with you. So uh, will we have a future financial and economic crisis? Like I said, they're two different things. The answer is yes to both. People will be greedy. People, companies, financial institutions will take their money. They will gamble it. They will leverage themselves up and up and up. And if they make uh, through this euphoric expectation and they make a mistake, well, guess what? Then they will have to deleverage. Then this is going to have a liquidity crisis. Then we're going to have a crash. But guess what? Our government is doing everything to uh, they can to prevent that from happening. Like I said, it happened in 2023 with, uh, with some of these banks, Signature Bank, Silicon Bank, all you know, uh, having a bank run. People are like, oh my goodness, take your money out right right now. And our government, our FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Company said, you know what? We're going to, um, you know, make sure that any money that you had invested into this company, you're going to get your money back. Don't worry, because they don't want a banking crisis. They don't want people to be scared. So even though there's laws that says, okay, only $250,000, everything out after that, you take the risk. Guess what happens? They they said, you're too big to fail. You're And that was a, a, a movie and book that we're going to talk about in the second training is that this is, we're playing a dangerous game. Yes, they're saving the economy, but they're also allowing wealthy, risky people to, uh, you know, have a moral hazard where they're being risky and riskier and they're not actually paying consequences for making bad decisions. So again, I'm just giving you guys different perspectives so that you guys continue to do your own research. I wanna thank Steve Keen. I wanna thank Ray Dalio and James Rickards for all of their information. Again, we talked about a lot of economic concepts, CPI, inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, all this other stuff. But I want you to know some of these concepts so that you're more educated. Watch this video training again when I share it with all the Electus Society community tomorrow, because there's so much information here, but the only way you're going to learn it is by re-listening to it, uh, uh, applying it, understanding it. I have listened to Jim Rickard's videos and Steve King over and over times, and every time I listen to it, I pick up more information. So these are the important concepts that you need to learn. Four reasons why leaders need to understand about money and the economy. Prepare for all possibilities so you won't be afraid. Choose the best policies, usually policies that promote economic growth and equality of uh, opportunity. Elect leaders with the best policies and avoid left-right bias. And finally, what we learned from the Ray Dalio video, we're going to talk more about this formula in the second training, but credit is the most important part of the economy. You know, the economy is based on the credit and the transaction. The Fed, our central bank, they can either adjust interest rates or print money. And remember, print money is a simplification. Fed actually creates credit through U.S. Treasury bonds, buying and selling them and requiring banks. We'll learn more about that in training, too. And then the banks take that money and then they lend it out to people, which creates even more money. OK, government can borrow, tax and spend. The, the economy goes through cycles, which we learn. Excess credit, economy expands, debt gets too high, deleveraging happens, deflation, recession. And the government and the Fed, everybody's trying to adjust these knobs to get this whole complex economy so that we don't have inflation and we don't have recession. And so one of the tools that they do is when debt burdens are too high, they cut spending, they do debt restructuring, defaulting, wealth redistribution, taxing and spending. They print new money or create new credit. But remember, printing a lot of money or creating a lot of new credit can lead to inflation. It doesn't necessarily automatically lead to inflation. Why? 
because it's psychological. That's what I wanted you to learn from this training. Velocity of money. It's something that's very important. And we're going to learn more in the second training. So I know we covered a lot of information. I wanted to say thank you so much for for sticking in with me through this uh, uh, training. It was a lot of information. I hope you got a lot out of it. Uh, please, uh, you know, fill out the post assessment. I love to get your feedback. The action steps that I recommend you take is rewatch this training. Uh, I also recommend watching the full 30 minute video of Ray Dalio just to start of absorbing these trainings. You're more than welcome to listen to Jim Rickards or other individuals, uh, but I definitely want you to attend the next training in a couple of weeks. Uh, you can download a free copy of this PowerPoint as soon as you fill out the post assessment and hit submit. You'll get a thank you pop up and you can have a link that you can download this entire PowerPoint. So at this point, uh, I'll take any questions that anybody has or any comments. I really appreciate it. So does anybody have any questions or does anybody have any comments? Feel free to unmute yourself or you could also put it in the chat. Maybe I should ask well any other final questions or comments all right i think we're good we we went over time so you know i don't want to take any more of your time thank you so much for attending this training and i appreciate all of you let's continue your journey learning more about money and the economy and i'll see you in the next training thanks so much bye 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 bye